mamá. Ma. Ma, 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 ma. Amen. Amen. Yes, Lord. Amen. Ma, ma, ma. Ma, ma, ma. Jesus and what he's done for me when I think about Jesus and how he set me free I can dance, 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 dance all night when I think about Jesus and what he's done for me when I think about Jesus and how he set me free I can shout, 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 shout Uh, that was uh, I can't hear myself I can't hear myself that uh, that was uh, that was a pause for praise and that was a pause for praise yes sir uh, amen Woo. feel a little better don't you if you can get this mic like that mic that they was holding, it would be real good for me. If you can get my mic like that mic. Mm. Amen. 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 Mama. All right. <laughs> Ah, Lord, have mercy. Amen. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Mm. Ma, 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 ma. Lord, have mercy. Think about it. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. Hey. Some some of us have something to be thankful for. Some of us have something to be grateful for. Ah. I'm trying to not grieve or quench the spirit, but I'm 
I want to do things decently and in order. But when I think about the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, Let us, let us pray, let us pray, let us pray. Gracious God, our Father, we hallow your name, we worship you, for there is none like you. I ask that in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, is that you would receive the fruit of our lips as prayer and praise for what you have done for us, what you are doing for us. And we wait with anticipation of what you're going to do. And I would ask that you would think with my mind, speak with my lips, function in my being. Just not just fill me, but spill me at your will. The name of the Lord Jesus, I ask it that an unbeliever be evangelized, a believer and get restoration and be restored. And, and then that those that need a place will become a part of this local assembly, we ask it for those that are viewing and those that are in view. In the strong name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray with thanksgiving. Amen and amen. There is a department in our government, the Treasury Department in our government, they have a group of people that specialize in verifying, clarifying, or debunking false bills from true bills. I mean, dollar bills, y'all. <laughs> It's interesting that the way that they do it was definitely contrary to the way that I assumed that it was done. I assumed many years ago that they would be studying false bills to verify and to clarify what is false. But to my amazement, I discovered that they study the real bill so closely by touch, by examination of the eye, that they're able to pick up 
when it is a false bill. That stands to be true when it comes to the family of God, the people of God. In the book of 1 John chapter 3, he lets us know how to detect a false Christian, a false unbeliever from that which is authentic and that which is truthful. It is in John chapter 3 that you will find these words in verses 8 and 9 that is read or written in the NIV version of Holy Writ. It says in John chapter, 1 John chapter 3, he who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. This reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works or the devil's works. No one who is born of God will continue in sin because God's seed remains in him or her. He or she cannot go on sinning because he has been born of God. I want to talk about the difference between the two. The difference between the two. I know we have been in the book of 1 John, as we would say in our day, for a minute. But these minutes spent in the book of 1 John, hopefully they have been helpful for us in our pilgrimage here on planet Earth. John has done such a phenomenal job based upon his audience that he talked to then that has the same semblance of those that are now. As there were false teachings and false doctrines then, they are some of the same false teachings and doctrines now. In every age, there is this issue called the proliferation of false teachings in comparison to that which is true, sound, and solid. So John picks up his pen for them then and for us now, that it is crucial for every born again, blood bought, baptized believer for every disciple of Christ that are truly a disciple of his. It's important that we know and what we ought to know and be convinced about what we know. He uses this term over and over again, no, 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 about 30 times in the book of 1 John alone. I think that his emphasis is that we ought to know. <laughs> we ought to know what we know and we ought to be convinced and convicted about what we know. It should not be no hesitation or reservation about what we ought to know. It ought not be no periods of not being sure of what we ought to know. We ought to know what we ought to know, whether it's early in the morning, in the noonday, or in the evening hours. John says we ought to know some things. 
and be convinced about some things so that when something else comes up that is contrary to what we know, we ought to be able to defend it and repudiate what is being propagated. There's no need for any Christian to be shallow or shy about what the scriptures declare what you and I ought to know. John saying in his epistle, it's written for grown folk. For folk that have been around in the faith and that has heard truth for a certain amount of times, John says, after a while, I'm writing to these individuals. These are people that has already believed in what he wrote in the gospel of John. These are individuals that have been born again that he explained in the gospel of John. These are individuals that have heard that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life in the gospel of John. They believed in the only begotten son of God. They have placed their faith in, trusted in, rested in God's gift through his son, believed in, and as a result of we are not not going to perish, but we have everlasting life. Right now, in this period, on this side of heaven, there is no equivocation, there is no doubt about those that may propagate that you really never become a son of God until, or a daughter of God, or a child of God until you get to heaven. No, we have that right now. We are that right now. That's not for the future, that's for the present, but it has futuristic promises of being a child of God. So in 1 John, he's talking to those that have already believed. Now he's fighting false teachings since you have believed. It's teachings that's contrary, that's trying to teach you how to behave. So John writes to say, now that you have believed, this is the way you ought to behave. Because your belief ought to affect your behavior. You just not ought to assent to what you believe intellectually. John says by using that word no, it ought to affect you experientially. It gets beyond just being a head thing. It goes down to your very soul, the essence of who you are. The soul comprises of your mind and your emotions and your will. It ought to affect the way that you think. This what we believe and what John writes about what we believe, what Paul writes about what we believe. It ought to affect your mind. It really ought to affect the way you think. It ought to be deleting some stinking thinking. And it ought to be literally importing and implying a new way of thinking. Um, we ought to be, as Paul says, once we have accepted Christ, we ought to present our bodies, our sumas, our corpses as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable worship or service. And in verse 2 he says, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed formed by the renewing of your noose in the Greek, which means your intellectual capacity. 
God has to, for every one of us, from the pulpit to the door, from the balcony to the floor, God has to change the way we think. Because your thinking affects your emotions and your emotions dictate to your volition or our volition because most of us will do what we feel before sometimes what we think. And then sometimes we will do what we think that will also govern how we feel, which will also affect what we do in our volition and in our will. Salvation is a package deal. God wants to save your soul the way you and I think which will affect the way you and I feel, which will affect the way you and I behave. Thank God for the gospel of Jesus Christ where he is not a one-dimensional savior, where he just saved my mind. But he also saved my emotions because my emotions were so twisted and so perverted Y'all making me think I'm the only one that was perverted in your emotional center. I'm going to keep on keeping on because y'all making me mad and it's my first Sunday back. <laughs> no, but I'm just saying that this whole issue about salvation and believing is multidimensional. He saves our will on how we do or what we do. He saves our emotions on how we feel, what we feel. He saves and changes our thinking. And this does not happen overnight. It's an ongoing process. He that began a good work in you and I will continue to perform it until the day that Jesus Christ comes back again. But this is how you can tell the difference between the two. What two? Glad you asked that question. I'm so glad to be back home because y'all keep asking the right questions. Here it is. It is the one who does the will and the work of God, the one who is born of God, and the one who is manipulated and controlled by the devil. There are two groups of people that he's talking to but it's one group of people that he's talking to about the two group of people, which says that there are usually two groups of people that gather when we gather. And if there are two groups of people that gather where, where we gather, we need to be discerning and we need to be spiritually informed enough that we can tell the difference between the two. Now, you look at me this morning. I'm looking at you. I see you looking at me. You think I don't, but I see you looking at me. And I not only see you, but I sense you looking at me and even those that are viewing because there is not only what I see but it's also what I sense and as, and as our young people say I feel your energy I'm feeling the kind of vibe that's in this sanctuary and I'm still going to proclaim and contest that there are two people in this sanctuary 
two kinds of people in this sanctuary. Not only based on what I feel and what I'm sensing, but based on primarily on what the word of God says. John says, he, dear children, verse seven, do not let anyone lead you astray which suggests that we have the propensity to be led astray. That's right, Holy Ghost filled, fire baptized, speaking in tongues, wallowing in the floor, running around the church people. We can be led astray. He who does, he said this, he who does what is right is righteous just as he, talking about God and God's son, is righteous. He who does what is sinful is of the devil. Now I'm going to break this down because I know this verse throws a lot of us off and will throw a lot of us off if you don't understand what's being said in this context as well as the verbs that are being used in this chapter. He says, who, he who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. Lord have mercy. This reason, the sons, the children of God, this reason, I'm sorry, the son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's works. No one who is born of God, this is going to throw you off, will continue in sin because God's seed remains in him in her, he or she cannot go on sinning because he has been born, she has <coughs> been born <coughs> of God. This is how we know who are the children of God, who are the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Did you see that? He named two different types of people the children of God and the children of the devil. Anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God, nor is anyone who does not love his brother. All right, I come to get, go to work. We got to go to work on this passage because I knew it threw some of your theology off because your theology is not holistically based based on you not collectively looking at the epistle of 1 John and then determining on this one passage that it's contrary to what John said previously. Now, now what is going on here? In the book of 1 John, in the first couple of chapters, my sisters and my brothers, the emphasis is on fellowship with God. We being in fellowship with him. What does it take for us to be in fellowship with God? Chapters three and four primarily deals with sonship or being born of God, which makes us already children of God. Chapter one and two deals with how we maintain fellowship with God. Chapters three, four, and five helps us to understand the reason why we ought to maintain fellowship with God is because we are children of God. Only those that are children of God could remain in fellowship with God. Walk with me, hope to make it clearer as we go on. My sisters and my brothers, this is, in John's words, so important to know the two and the difference between the two. It seems like that this verse in chapter three contradicts 
what is said in chapter one. What do you mean? Verse six says in chapter three, y'all got your Bibles open? Verse six says this. Verse five says, but you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, period. And in him, Christ, is no sin. Got it? There is no sin in Christ. He came to take away our sin. Verse 6. Monkey wrench seems to be what appears in verse 6 in the gears of Scripture. No one who lives in him and I'm glad this translation does the verbs justice. Here it is. No one that lives in Christ that are children of God keeps on sinning. Key. Watch this. No one who continues in some translation practices. Am I right? who practice or who continues in sin has either seen him or known him. Lord have mercy. I, I, got, I, got, a, I, got, a, I got a lock and load right here for at least 10 minutes because this verse has literally made many Christians misinterpretate this verse where it sounds like that this verse is teaching, <coughs> excuse me, perfectionism. It seems like it's implying that if anyone sins, they are not of God. But if anyone does not sin, and they, watch this, can't sin because they are children of God. That's not what the verse says. The verse does not say that if you become a believer, you no longer sin. And the validation of you not sinning is the validation of you being a child of God. We know that's not true because the same book of 1 John in chapter 1, if you remember, it says, if we say that we do not sin, y'all not walking with me in the book, if we claim to be without sin in verse 8 of chapter 1, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Verse 10 says, if we claim that we have not sinned, we make him out of a liar and his word has no place in our lives. So how can John and 1 John chapter 1 say, if you walk around here acting like you are holier than thou and you have not sinned, watch this, he says, you be lying. Let me put it another way. You be capping. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. You capping could say that you don't sin or have not sinned. And the reason why he addresses that that way because of the false teaching that I was trying to explain to you in the beginning of the message. And one of the false teachings that were going on then is the doctrine of Gnosticism. And there was also another doctrine that followed through that was Docicism. And those two doctrines, a mixture of both, suggested that number one, Christ did not come in a human body. It was a different kind of body. So therefore he was not sinning or he was not capable of sinning and therefore since he came in a different kind of body uh, 
um, therefore he wasn't able to sin or he didn't sin because his body was different and that's why John wrote and said no 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 we seen him with our own eyes we heard him with our own ears and we handled him with our own hands the word of life no it was a real body it was sure enough sure enough a body because they were trying to justify that if you are in the body God is not concerned about what we do in our flesh He's only concerned about the spiritual side of us, the mental side of us. So don't worry about what you do down here. Don't worry about what sin you put out. God is not interested. He knows that this body is sinful and therefore you don't have to worry about what you do in your human body in this tent, this tabernacle that is called in scripture. You don't have to worry about that. Just deal with the spiritual stuff. John says, no, that's not what Christianity or being a disciple of Christ is about or is like. No, Christ did come in a body. We know he did and it was a real body because we seen him with our eyes, we heard him with our ears, we handled him, we touched him with our hands. He slept like other people sleep in a human body. He grew hungry like other people grow hungry in a human body. No, matter of fact, when he rose from the dead, he had a different kind of body, but it was a body, so much so that it has scars in it because you remember Thomas said, I'm not going to believe him until I put my finger in his side where I saw he was scarred at and in his feet and Jesus showed up and said now Thomas touch me if it wasn't a real body he wouldn't be able to be touched I wish I had time so therefore it was a real body and therefore that being a real body he's saying to you and I we can live in this body but we don't have to live by the body we don't have to live by the dictations that the body may produce because of. And when we do, he says, don't act like you don't sin when you do sin. He says, God's got a remedy. He says, but if you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. This passage in chapter 3 implies or some have suggested that they that do sin are not born of God. The verb here, practice, means, watch this, habitually and continually. Oh, let me back up for a minute. If a believer says that they are a believer and they are a child of God, and you always see them constantly, consecutively, nonstop, continually, habitually, always sinning, they are not a child of God. Ooh, the Bible says we ought not judge one another. Judge ye not, lest ye be judged. The Bible does not say we can't judge nobody. It says that when you do judge, make it a full measure. Make sure you've judged it fully from every perspective of what it is that you are judging. Because if you do it this way for other people, when it comes time for you to be judged, they will do the same thing when it comes to you. That make any sense? He says in this passage of scripture that if one claims to be a child of God, they cannot, he, she cannot continue, keep on sinning. Verse 6, y'all walking with me? No one who continues in sin has neither seen him or know him. 
All right, let me lay it at you this way. Now I'm going to try to wrap this up. If someone says out of their face, I'm a Christian, I'm a child of God, we are all children of God. And stop, pump them brakes. This is the difference. You have to know this. You have to understand this. And I'm not saying that you don't. I just want to affirm to you that do and then to inform those that don't. Everybody that walks on planet Earth is not a child of God. I'm going to say that again. Everybody that walks on planet Earth is not a child of God. It's going to go viral in a minute because people are going to be hating on that statement. I'm saying to you, everyone that walks on planet Earth is not a child of God, but they are a creature of God. They're part of his creation. And when the creature sins, they sin against the creator. But those that are children of God, when they sin, they sin against their father. Okay, let me, let me see if I can back that up and say it another way. Everybody on planet Earth is not a child of God. Only those that have believed in the Son of God whom the Father has sent to save us from our sins, they become children of God. Help me somebody. And if you are a child of God, according to 1 John 3, one thing that dwells in you is the seed. Did y'all read that verse? It's the seed that abides in you. Here this is, here this clear. That seed does not sin. That new nature does not sin. But the old nature does sin. Watch this. When you are not born again, you don't get a new nature. You are born the first time with that same sinful only nature. Y'all walking with me? And as you walk planet Earth, live planet Earth, when you do sin and you will sin, you sin against the Creator. But when a child of God sins, it's not the seed that does the sinning. That can't sin. There's nothing in the new nature that propagates sin in the life of the believer. The propagation of sin is propagated by the old Adamic nature that we had when we get, we have when we were born the first time. But when you're born again, you get a new nature that's from the Father, which is propagated by the seed, which is the Word of God, and it pregnates you and I with a new nature. Everything in that nature is from God. It does things that point to Christ, points to God. It makes us feel right when we do it. Lord have mercy. I'm going somewhere. The problem is that some have with this verse and have misinterpreted this verse by saying that those that are children of God do not sin. That is not what the verse says. We do. 1 John 1.8, 1 John 1.10, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, says that we have the capacity to sin, but the capacity is not habitual. 
continual, consistently, and constantly. We have the seed of God that abides in us and that part of our nature does not sin. Y'all walking with me? And even though we have the capacity, so when the child of God sins, they sin against their father. Little girl, a young girl, she's a teenager, she went to this party. She was a Christian, she went to this party and you know, they were having a nice time, having fun. And then the person that they threw the party for said, hey, let's leave here and let's go down to this other spot where we can also continue and finish the party. Christian told her date, listen, I, I don't want to go there, so it's all right. I would like to be taken home. One of her girlfriends became sarcastic of her remark and said to her, oh, what's wrong? You afraid that your father might get you if you go to this other party? She responded, the Christian girl responded and said, no, I'm not afraid because you're saying, you're suggesting that my father might hurt me if I go to this party. No, I'm not afraid of being hurt. I'm afraid of hurting my father. Shh. Come here, I think you got it. So when a Christian sins, they're not concerned about what other people think or what other people going to fear. That's why a Christian can't keep continually, constantly, consecutively sin in their lives all the time and every time you see them because we're more concerned about hurting our father than our father hurting us. And our father, he does, he can, he will chastise us. He will reprimand us. Come on, talk back to me. But I know this, that the seed that's in us, when we do sin, it does not make us feel comfortable of relying, depending, and constantly staying in whatever sin that that might be. You have something on the inside being contrary to that which is being manifest on the outside. So therefore, you don't want to keep hurting the Father. Keep grieving the Spirit. Trying to quench the Spirit. Not want to not feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Because when He gets on you and I, like the way He does about you and I do, what we do is that we confess it, we acknowledge it, we turn from it and walk in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. You cannot be a child of God and keep on doing whatever you want to do. You cannot be a child of God and continually, constantly, consecutively keep living in sin any way you want to live in sin. You cannot be a child of God and be a habitual sinner for the rest of your life or sin for the rest of your life. Not the child of God. They get convicted. They get challenged. God puts stuff in your path that'll deter you from. God will start whooping your gluteus maximus that will deter you from and put you back in the path of righteousness. Do I have a witness in this house? Say yes! 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 Oh, yes! Uh, I mean, 
the Bible is replete with Christians, believers, sinning. I'm glad that it doesn't close it up, hide it. Come on, the Bible is replete with illustrations of believers being able to sin, watch this, occasionally. Come on, talk back to me, somebody. Got any Bible students in here? You remember Abraham in Genesis chapter 12? He lied about his wife, Sarah, and said that it was his sister. When you follow the story through in five chapters that follow, did you ever see him doing that again? That because we can sin occasionally. Help me somebody. You, you, you remember Moses in number chapter 20 when he got mad, got ticked off, and his temper went one way, and instead of speaking to the rock, he hit the rock. Help me somebody. He did sin. But after that, you don't read about him doing that again. Come on, talk back to me. You read about David sleeping with Bash. Sheba killing her husband and taking him on as a taking her on as a wife. Do you read after that of David keep repeating that y'all not talking back to me? You mad at me? You, you remember Peter in Matthew chapter 26 where Peter cussed, lied, and denied about Jesus, but after his resurrection and after he had an encounter with Jesus, have you ever seen Peter or heard Peter? Peter cussed, lying, and denying anymore. That was because it was occasional. He was the one that wrote, be vigilant. Look around for your adversary. The devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may defile. You know why? Because Peter became a victim of him being a roaring lion. Peter was just not vigilant. Lord have mercy. Now he testifies on the other side of it. He said, watch out. I'm telling you, number uno testimony, number uno victim, the devil can use you as a child of God. The devil can make you cuss, lie, and... See, some of y'all too spiritual, like he can't use you to do some wicked things. But if you get up from it and you stand up, the righteous person falls seven times, but yet they get back up again. That's occasionally sinning, not constantly, not consecutively, not continually. We stand up and we get stronger because of our weaknesses. We get strength because we faint and fall out. Don't grow weary in wells due season. For he said, well doing for in due season you will reap and not faint. Y'all not talking back to me. But I remember some promises. If you get up, call on his name. They that wait the Lord shall renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like an eagle. They shall run and not faint. I'm telling you, he can, he will restore, strengthen. But you as a child of God, if you say you are a child of God, there will not be a perpetuation. There will not be habitual. It will not be continual. When we do fall, that's the difference between the two. So let me say this. Which one are you? Are you a child of God? Or are you faking the funk? By thinking you can do what you do, whatever you want to do, how long you want to do it and nothing happens. Oh, there it is right there. Thank you, Jesus. If you continue habitually, constantly, consecutively, and nothing happens to you, 
that may be a validation that you never were. A child of God. So let me say this to you. Let me ask you, 